of the series, the first public lecture and reception for this series. My name is Lucy Somoyo. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, Innovation, and Postgraduate Studies at Stellenbosch University. So I really want to welcome, on, uh, welcome you on this great afternoon. Um, the other day, you know, the weather changed suddenly, and I thought, my God, the Swedish have brought the weather with them. <laughs> so, but today it's really beautiful, I think, just meant for this lecture. So I'd like to greet you all. And especially, of course, our Chancellor, Justice Edwin Cameron, uh, who's author and also retired Constitutional Court judge, and is the 15th uh, Chancellor of Stellenbosch University since 2019. He's also the host of this session. He will be introduced, of course, in full uh, by our Vice Chancellor and Rector. So um, I also want to, uh, to, to just mention that uh, for us today is a very important day, of course, um, and uh, I know that uh, most of you have been busy with uh, the events that have been taking place, so I just want to thank you for making time to come to this event as well, considering um, how busy the week has been. I also want to acknowledge uh, the members of the rectorate who are present. I saw Professor Nico Koopman here and uh, any other uh, colleagues who are present, uh, the deans present. I did see Professor um, uh, Louise Vanik, who's also here today. I also want to acknowledge, of course, um, most importantly, my boss, um, our vice chancellor and rector, Professor Vim de Villiers, who's going to come up to the stage to introduce you. And then I must also uh, acknowledge, of course, our guest speaker for today, um, um, Dr. Um, Clifton L. Barry III, who will be introduced in full by the uh, Vice Chancellor. He's the Chief of the TB Research Section in the Laboratory of Clinical Infections Diseases um, and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in the US. Um, and uh, so we'll do that introduction. But just a few other introductions. I'm really excited that amongst us we have um, the Future Professors Program uh, colleagues who are doing chemistry who have joined us. Can you just raise your hands if you're in the room? I did see a few walking in, our future professors program. Yeah, so we are glad to have you with us. And I think it's important for us to have this series and also for the benefit that they have also to those scholars who are coming up. And then we also have a very strange group of people who are with us today, the group of mathematicians who are attending the, the first, actually it's the first series of the symmetries in differential equations uh, group that are here. Can you raise your hands if you're here? Okay, so there's a group behind there. Please give them a hand and we welcome them again. So the whole idea is we want to do applied mathematics and to understand what challenges are there in our world. So we are really excited that you're part of this lecture. So now it gives me great pleasure to invite, of course, our Vice Chancellor and Rector, Professor Bim De Villiers, uh, who's going to join us. He asked not to be introduced. Um, but he will introduce himself in, in two lines uh, when he comes up. Um, he, he's a gastroenterologist, which is very interesting, I think, from a medical point of view. And so, yeah, Professor De Villiers, can you come on stage, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Moyo. Uh, and it's wonderful to be here this afternoon. And good evening to our very distinguished guests and esteemed colleagues and also the students and all the others who are attending uh, conferences here. So I have a distinct pleasure of welcoming each and every one of you to, I think this is a wonderful event, Stellenbosch University's Chancellor's Public Lecture, which forms part of the Nobel in Africa Symposium series. And this evening's gather, gathering is indeed a testament to the power of collaboration the spirit of inquiry 
and the dedication to advancing knowledge. And we're truly honored by the presence of our esteemed guests from the Embassy of Sweden, First Secretary for Trade and Economic Affairs, Martin Jönrud, and the representatives of the Wallenberg Foundation, Ingrid Sundström and Sarah Mazur, have graced us with their presence. Uh, and it's, it's, there's no question that their support and, and, and encouragement have been instrumental in making this event possible. And I would also like to express our heartfelt gratitude to our symposium conveners, Frederick Almquist from Umia University, Jackie Snoop from Stellenbosch University, and Maria Lerm from Linkoping uh, University. And a lot of hard work has gone into bringing uh, us all here together tonight. So in reflecting on the Bell in Africa, Wow, what a, what a wonderful partnership, what a profound partnership. A collaborative effort between Stellenbosch University and STIAS, Stellenbosch Institute of Advanced Study under the auspices of the Nobel Foundation and the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, generously supported by the Newton Alice Wallenberg Foundation. This is the second symposium in the series, uh, and we are very pleased also that we will Next year we will have economics and then physiology and medicine and then literature and then peace. And we're very privileged this year to host some of the foremost scientists in the field of tubercul tuberculosis and antibiotic resistance. So we're gathering here tonight to explore the 178th Nobel Symposium in Chemistry with a focus on tuberculosis and antibiotic resistance from basic drug discovery to the clinic, from bench to bedside. And we thus embark on a journey into research that holds immense significance for the well-being of our continent. Africa is home to the youngest and the fastest growing population globally. And projections suggest that by 2050, more than half of the world's population growth with, will occur right here on our continent. So very compelling statistics, and therefore investing in intellectual pursuits in Africa is not just logical, but really imperative. We're very proud of the Nobel in Africa initiative. It's a remarkable collaboration and a testament to the strength of partnerships. So. Yes, Stias has, by presenting this initiative, become the first institution outside of Scandinavia to host Nobel Symposia on behalf of the Nobel Foundation, and really transcending international boundaries and the boundaries of academia to engage with a wider community. And I'm also proud as Rector and Vice Chancellor of Stellenbosch University that this endeavor truly resonates with our university's vision of inclusivity and its commitment to advancing knowledge in service to society. Not only what we're good at, but also what we are good for. We are an institution deeply rooted in Africa, uh, yet with global relevance. And this symposium highlights that our role in advancing thought leadership. And this is a, a world in turmoil, as we all know. And it's a complicated world. And as we look forward to the complicated challenges that the world will face in the coming decade, we recognize that comprehensive universities like Stellenbosch University have a very crucial role to play. Our capacity for research and innovation and education is poised to make a significant impact on the pressing global issues of our time. And I think the recent launch of our state-of-the-art facility, the Bi Biomedical Research uh, Institute at our medical school, the BMRI, it really illustrates our commitment to leading research on the African continent. And our collaboration and engagement with international networks are very deeply ingrained in our institutional ethos. We're actively participating in the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate and the African Research Universities Alliance, and that we want to deliver 
research with a global resonance. resonance. So we have recently established two schools, a school for climate studies that's actively contributing to collaborative research and also actively participating in initiatives such as COP27 and it forms part of the global, we form part of the global alliance of universities on climate or GAUC, we love acronyms at universities and notably we're the only African university within this alliance which really signifies our substantial global contribution to addressing these important challenges. And then a second school is our school for data science and computational thinking that has really been very successful over the last few years and, and has received recognition for its groundbreaking work including a genomic sequencing and genomic surveillance uh, in the Center for Epidemic Response and Innovation. So that's part of the background and the skeleton that we provide and the Nobel in Africa Symposium aims to provide another international platform for sharing groundbreaking scholarship thereby showcasing the pivotal role of scientific research in shaping the future of our continent and the world. So I would again like to express our profound gratitude to the Nobel Foundation, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and the Newton Alice Wallenberg Foundation, and to reiterate, without your generous support, none of this would have been possible. I am now going to ask our Chancellor, Justice Edwin Cameron, to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Clifton Earl Barry III, I do, I'm going to ask him to do that, but I do first have to declare a significant conflict of interest. And that is, the topic is the future of tuberculosis chemotherapy. Now, as you heard, I'm a gastroenterologist, uh, lapsed gas, no, I'm not lapsed, <laughs> but I'm now a vice chancellor, uh, but I also got a PhD in uh, immunology, in innate immunity, uh, in very much a macrophage laboratory. So it was dedicated to macrophages. And macrophages are central to tuberculosis. <laughs> and there are this few select of us who truly believe that macrophages are at the center of the universe. <laughs> so I'm very pleased to be able to listen to to, the, to this lecture, and I look forward to what uh, Dr. Berry is going to tell us. Over to Justice Cameron. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor, Rector. I am nominally the ceremonial head of this university. But the rector told me that I had to put on my jacket. <laughs> that established the real hierarchy. I thought that with our wondrously distinguished and accomplished guest being dressed as a sensible academic on a hot <laughs> spring afternoon, I could get away without my jacket. But the rector said, "Get with your bike, you answer it. So. <laughs> this lecture is a big deal. And I want to ask the head of STIAS, Professor Edward Kirumira, to stand up for a moment. I'm very honored, Professor, to be introducing our guest. And uh, I do so with also a conflict of interest because on the way in, I got to ask our guest a lot of very dumb questions, which he answered with great grace and informativeness. And of course, like the rector, I have an intense interest. 50% uh, of the people in Southern Africa who uh, have TB also have HIV, like I have. And the, the rector rightly mentioned the importance of partnerships. Uh, one of the few things uh, that are not known about our country, which apart from the catastrophe in the Middle East, which is bearing very, very heavily on all of us, the 
monstrous inhumanities that are being inflicted on both sides. Uh, we also have a, a, a gravely uh, dysfunctional state at the moment uh, with collapsing state institutions, mass corruption, even after we had a significant uh, corruption, anti-corruption probe led by the Deputy Chief Justice with whom I sat in the Constitutional Court. We have fresh instances uh, almost every day, including in the national scheme that provides subvention for uh, relatively under-resourced students here. But one of the good news things is our antiretroviral treatment program. Seven million people like me owe their lives in South Africa, the largest, most successful antiretroviral treatment program anywhere in the world. And it is a public-private partnership. The Witz Health Consortium, the Englovo Trust, a, a, a whole series. I think, where's Professor Tulio Dolavera? I'm going to exercise my post-jacket chancellorial privilege and ask him to stand up as well. Where were you, Professor? A another. He was, he was witness to my dumb question, so he must be somewhere. But um, the, the, the fact that, that we can collaborate and that we can make things work through public-private partnerships, through be it said, USAID dollars through our own funding and through the skills that come from Stellenbosch's medical school, from the other medical schools, is a significant beacon of hope, like this lecture. It shows that we can pursue academic and intellectual excellence in the midst of, not in the midst of, not despite, but because of everything happening around us, we determined to make our university our tertiary institution, the rigors of our organizational functioning, we determined to make them all succeed. And against that background, Dr. Barry, having experienced your grace and generosity and geniality in answering, there's one question that Dr. Barry's got to answer over. I want to know the epidemiological specificity of Central and Southern Africa. It's not sex. President Mbeki wrongly thought it was being targeted. If it were black people sex, there would be an equivalent epidemic in West Africa, and there isn't. And that is, there must be some other specificity uh, distinct to Central and Southern Africa. Spoiler, I think it's genetic. <laughs> you may chuckle, Rector, Vice-Cancelier, but I'm going to ask you whether you have published 120 papers. <laughs> Our guest has published 120 papers. Please applaud him. In TB alone. He did his doctorate uh, at Cornell after a postdoc at Johns Hopkins, where he met, where's the professor who met? I, I, I beg your pardon, professor, I, I met you. Verschoon my. Can I give you a alsjeblieft? Straus, Eric Straus. I get it Professor Eric Strauss was a colleague, and our uh, guest's boss at NIAD, where he is now, was uh, for a long time a very distinguished virologist, also a huge impact on AIDS and HIV, uh, which was Dr. Anthony Fauci. So we are overjoyed that you have come to grace us this evening. Uh, as I said, this is a big deal, and you are the big deal. Okay, good. The faces are off the screen. <laughs> so, f first of all, um, wow, what, what a week it's been. I mean, it's been a fantastic week, and I can't... Uh, adequately express the, the great time that I've had this week and uh, the generosity of Stace and the Nobel Foundation and the whole meeting has come together to be just fantastic. I mean, I've, there are a lot of my old friends here and then there are a lot of new people that I've met um, at the meeting and I think it's, um, it's been just fantastic. So thank you very much. Uh, second, I think the part of the reason that I'm here talking to you is because a lot of what I want to talk to you about actually happened in South Africa in the Western Cape. And a lot of that is because of my affiliation with 
UCT and the generosity of Val uh, Mizrahi and the, the UCT administration in giving me a second home uh, at the IDM um, at UCT. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is, actually happened here in South Africa. And I somewhat tongue-in-cheek um, wrote that uh, this was a chemist side because I'm actually not going to talk to you about chemistry at all tonight. Um, this is going to be all stuff that's happened uh, pretty much exclusively in the Western Cape. But it is going to des describe what I think um, we're looking at for developing the future of uh, TB um, chemotherapy. So before I do that, I have gotten so many questions about exactly what am I holding in that picture that was used to advertise <laughs> the symposium. Um, and why do you look so ridiculously happy in that picture? <laughs> And the answer is, this was a trip that I did uh, several years ago with a group of wildlife biologists from New Zealand and Australia in French Polynesia and British Polynesia. And what I'm holding in my hands is one of the rarest seabirds in the world. In fact, it's the last time the species has been documented um, in the wild. There is an estimated population of only 250 individuals. And so for, for a lifetime birder like myself, this is the equivalent of just the absolute epitome of anything you could accomplish in your life <laughs> is holding one of the rarest seabirds in the world was fantastic. <clears throat> so that's what it is. <clears throat> All right, so now to a more serious um, subject, um, TB treatment. And so um, in the early parts of the 19th and 20th century, this was TB treatment. Um, this is a TB sanatorium. Uh, this one happens to be in America, but of course they were all over the world at the time. And at the time, we had no chemotherapy. And the only real uh, thing we could offer TB patients was clean air, good food, um, and try to boost their intrinsic um, immune uh, um, uh, resistance uh, to the disease. And needless to say, that didn't always work um, so well. And that really changed uh, with what was the first, what I'll call the first antibiotic uh, rev revolution, which started in 1943 with the discovery of streptomycin by Selman Boxman, um, and that almost unbelievably rapid introduction of those drugs into the clinic speaks to how desperate people were for TB treatment. And over the next 10 to 20 years, we saw this mir miraculous wave of innovation and uh, a serious application of resources from both the pharma industry and the academic sector because TB was a threat to everybody in Europe. And so this was a first world disease at that point and the first world brought its resources to bear on it and created a set of drug uh, molecules that uh, were uh, then able to be used to treat TB uh, patients. And so the, the question um, I like to look back on and reflect on historically is how did we take that collection of drugs and develop that into an effective uh, treatment regimen that we still give uh, to patients today? And the answer is uh, because of a very um, elegant and uh, incredible series of large clinical trials that were run by the British Medical Research Council in East Africa and Asia um, that reduced treatment duration from an initial two years uh, to what they called ultra short course chemotherapy, which was um, six months. Now, we scratch our heads today at the, attempting to rationalize ultra short course because that seems like anything but, um, but that was um, the ultimate standard of care that the BMRC trials uh, settled on. And um, it was an amazing mobilization of resources that I don't think we could ever parallel today because there were huge numbers of trials and huge investments because, again, this was a first world disease at that point in time. This affected mainland Europe and America and was uh, a disease everybody cared about and everybody knew about. And uh, we settled on six months uh, because that left us with patients who mostly were cured at the end of six months. And when I say mostly cured, I mean they, about 5% of them de redeveloped disease after they stopped treatment, but that was considered acceptable, and that's drug relapse. And 5%, uh, we'll come back to these numbers, but the 5% the um, really uh, represented patients who failed after six months of chemotherapy. But in fact, if you gave patients four months of chemotherapy, about 75% of patients were cured stably. And if you gave them three months of chemotherapy, about 50% of patients were cured. So it was already clear in the BMRC trials that this notion of how long do you have to treat patients, we were settling for the lowest common denominator. We, we chose to over-treat everybody so we would avoid those relapses in a small number of patients who required that full six months of treatment. 
So in 2023, I'll posit to you that we are standing on uh, the verge of the second uh, revolution in chemotherapy and tuberculosis. And uh, this incomplete uh, uh, global new TB drug pipeline, which is put together by a couple of groups, but the working group on new TB drugs from WHO is primarily responsible for it, isn't even complete. And uh, there are so many new drugs coming up the pipeline as a result of massive investments in the early preclinical space by both my own institute, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and other um, organizations, uh, including EDCTP and other European uh, organizations, that have brought forward a collection of drugs that are now entering into early clinical testing. And I think. The challenge to us now is how do we take advantage of that windfall and how do we put these together into treatments, shortening regimens that actually change the outcome of the epidemic and actually influence or tip the curve of the epidemic so that we're no longer uh, treating patients for six months and we're no longer seeing uncontrolled pandemic raging in the background that uh, now uh, supersedes COVID once again. And we know this is possible because in just my career, and I think many other people's career, we've watched bedaquiline, delamidid, and pertominid, um, three new molecules that have recently been FDA approved. We've watched them sort of enter into and change clinical practice. So we know this can happen, and we know it's going to continue to happen as new molecules enter into this, uh, this, uh, this pathway. Um, I'm not going to go through any of these in any detail. I just want to give you a flavor. And yes, a lot of them have fatal flaws. Not all of them will make it all the way into the clinic, but uh, quite a number of them are going to make it into the clinic. And the question uh, that I've been struggling with is how do we do this without the resources of the British Medical Research Council or the uh, weight of uh, the number of clinical trials that we would need to do, which now is becoming astronomical, to actually examine all of the possible combinations and which one is going to be the best from that. And so the key questions, I'm going to go through um, these four questions, um, is really how do we put these together in a way that we can explore synergies and antagonisms between combinations? Um, the second is do we really need to achieve a sterile cure uh, to avoid relapse? Do we ever really kill every bacteria within a patient? Um, what lesion types determine that treatment duration and how do we actually get to uh, addressing those more specifically? And how do we assess the sort of variability in an initial disease presentation? And I'll show you, I'm going to expand on each of these. I'm just giving you the, the broad outline. And so I think first, how do we look for synergies and antagonisms? Um, and uh, my uh, good friend and collaborator, Andreas Daikon, is seated in the audience as well, um, has for decades now, I think, um, made uh, a career out of doing these sort of early phase two evaluations, which are usually the first time a drug sees a human TB patient. And they're called early bactericidal activity. Um, he's a master at it. Um, you take inpatients in a clinic and you harvest sputum from them every day and you enumerate quantitatively the number of bacteria that are present in the sputum and you do that every single day so you can measure the decline in uh, EBA. And it's, it's a great first-in-man study. It's, it is the standard of care and it is recommended by both the US FDA and by the EMA as the way you go about doing TB <coughs> drug dis discovery. And so um, it's also has a small sample size, a limited study duration, so you can actually turn these around relatively quickly. Um, for years, I argued against EBA studies because they really don't line up very well with what we know about achieving sterilizing cure in patients. So you can see a very dramatic drop in the EBA, but the drug doesn't actually have much impact on how long a patient needs to take the drugs, to take the, the combination in order to, uh, to be cured. And finally, I thought, well, if I can't beat them, I better figure out a way to join them. <clears throat> and so um, I proposed uh, to Andreas that we do this, um, uh, this what we've called the next-gen uh, EBA study. I'm not going to belabor this. I, this makes the same point as, as I said before. What happens in the patient's sputum doesn't really correlate with the long-term outcome. You can sterilize quickly and still require a long treatment. So there's something more to it that we're not seeing if we're just looking at the sputum. And I'm going to spend a lot of time describing to you what I think that actually looks like. And so um, we just described um, more uh, innovative ways that we could possibly do this um, uh, more quantitatively than conventional EBA. 
And so with Andreas, we propose to do the conventional EBA, but pair it with a, a, a sort of advanced imaging modality, PET-CT, which hadn't really been used in TB patients before. And also with my uh, friend and colleague here at Stellenbosch, uh, Gerhard Walzel, who I don't think is here tonight, um, but who's made a, a career out of doing uh, immunologic biomarkers of response to therapy. And so we would take patients, enroll them into, and study all three different aspects of this at the, at the same time. And in this way, we hoped we could look for synergies and antagonisms, and we could hope, hopefully develop more quantitative estimates of how sterilizing a particular drug was going to be. And so we recruited 160, we, Andreas recruited, 160 drug-naive HIV-negative patients with sputum smear positive tuberculosis into eight treatment arms in 20 patients per group. Um, they got a baseline PET-CT, and after 14 days of monotherapy or the combinations that I've shown there, um, uh, got a repeat PET-CT, and then they go on standard of care treatment for six months in the National TB Control Program. And so that's, the duration of the study is only 14 days, which is which is great, but that's the standard EBA methodology. The question was, could we get more information um, out of that? And uh, I'm going to show you. So this is the, the sort of conventional EBA. This is how many bugs are present in the patient's sputum over time. On the left is just showing you the, the average decline in uh, CFU for, with different combinations, um, the estimated effect of the drugs, and what you see is what we pretty much expected to see from historical studies that had happened. And on the right, I'm showing you a slightly different representation of that, which is a per patient uh, estimate of that uh, magnitude, just to give you a sense of what the variability looks like. And because when I show you the PET-CT data, I'm going to show you what the per patient uh, analysis looks like. And so on the, on the left is the sort of the linear mixed effects model of what the EBA is, which is a good model for it and used, again, agreed very well with what we had seen historically. And on the right just shows you the, re the variability within patients that, as they're measuring that response. And these are standard drugs, right? So this is not anything surprising. These are all the frontline drugs drugs and uh, the moxifloxacin, which, uh, which people have argued was a great com um, addition to it, and then the two and four drug combinations that were of interest to us at the time for reasons that aren't important uh, for this talk. And so this shows you the, um, the sort of bulk level uh, PET-CT results. And so PET-CT is a measure of, so on the left, it's uh, the, the total lesion volume extracted from the lungs in patients. And on the right, shows you the change in glycolytic activity. And the bulk level statistics are, well, they're bulk level statistics, right? They sort of uh, uh, homogenize everything within a single patient and within the 20 patient arm. And they say, okay, how did it overall change? So it's informative, but it's not super informative. And on the right, I'm showing you, uh, the, 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 again, the per patient analysis. But this time, I've done it a little bit differently because each patient has multiple contributions to these because each lesion within the patient is represented as a different, as, as, as a different sphere within that, showing you the kind of variability in response you see. And what you see is you know, our standard of care drugs like HRZE, they work pretty good. Um, you know, many lesions are, respond, are responding quite a bit, but you also see that there are lesions within the same patient, some of which progress and others of which actually regress. And that's an important distinction. I think what, that's what PET-CT allows you to get at is that not every lesion in a patient is the same. And we know that, and we say, okay, not every bacteria is the same, but I'm actually pushing it a little bit farther and saying we can actually start to talk about what lesion types are responsible for the treatment and what lesion types respond to different kinds of drugs. So I call that the first level analysis. That's just the bulk, what happened. In the second level analysis, we took, the more, we took a more computational approach. And we do, um, with the help of some very talented image analysis uh, scientists at the, the National Cancer Institute who do this for lung cancer all the time, we developed automated ways of segmenting out the lung volumes. And then we divided that up into we call them cubes. I mean, that it doesn't matter what they are. They're sort of collections of voxels that we can pair across the two study visits. And then we can ask what happens within those voxels uh, over time. And that analysis turns out to be much more um, revealing about what's actually happening with the different drug treatments. And so one um, graphic illustration of that, I think, is seen in this particular set of scans, where you see a lesion. Um, at baseline in this patient that extends uh, through the left uh, lower lobe and is this huge consolidative area that responds actually quite well. 
And then you see this lesion segment in the lower, uh, the, the inferior lobe that actually progresses over time. Now that's with one particular drug, but that's not a unique phenomenon. That happened with every single drug and combination that we actually looked at. And what that let us do was then take the cubes and compare them by their baseline characteristics and then how did they respond. And for this particular example, this is pyrazinamide, which is a treatment that we've heard about quite a bit today um, that uh, influences that we knew uh, should in, uh, interact with the immune system in a way that inflammation would help boost the activity of pyrazinamide. And that's exactly what we see. And don't worry about what, these, uh, what the graphs are. They're different radiologic measures. But what you can see is that depending on the baseline uh, SUV, the baseline amount of inflammation that was present, there was a much greater change in areas that were inflamed versus areas that were not inflamed. In fact, areas where there wasn't a lot of inflammation are where the disease progressed. And so it just showed you how the drug was interacting directly with the immune response in a way that accelerated uh, the drug's clearance. And that's the kind of thing you can learn from a uh, PET CT that you can't easily see from just looking at the bugs that are present in this butum. Well, we also knew from historical studies that INH and pyrazinamide um, showed a synergistic activity in patients in achieving sterilizing cure in patients. And we could see exactly the same thing. And this is, uh, again, this is what you would expect uh, for the combination of INH and pyrazinamide together. And what we observed was much greater than that, which showed the synergy that we already knew in the clinical literature should exist in those uh, patient scans. And likewise, we could see an antagonism, uh, which again, we knew from historical studies between pyrazinamide and rifampicin where the two drugs uh, antagonize each other and have less than additive effects uh, when they're combined uh, in patients. And so we could then use these sorts of tools uh, as a way to get to um, how we uh, evaluate individual drugs and individual combinations of drugs. And this is not just limited to old drugs and what we think we know from old drugs. Uh, this is a GSK 656. Um, David Barros was meant to be here tomorrow, uh, unfortunately won't be um, able to attend, so Andreas and I are sort of making up for his lack of uh, attendance at the meeting, uh, his unfortunate absence from the meeting, I'll put it that way. Um, this is a first-in-class brand new uh, drug that has been through safety studies, and this is the first time it's been in uh, patients, and Andreas will show you most of the results, but I just want to show you a couple of things from the, um, the PET-CT analysis of this that are pretty striking. And to show you, this is just one example. Again, uh, on the right, I'm going to show you this sort of bulk level analysis. But then I'm going to focus you in on the, uh, the, the detailed uh, analysis that you can see from comparing the before and after 14 days a treatment with GSK656 as an individual agent. And what you see is quite a potent uh, reduction in the amount of inflammation, the size of air present in that cavity, and uh, the total amount of disease present within that, that cavity. Now you can say this is just one patient, but that actually wasn't the best patient. I didn't pick the best one. I picked one that was sort of middle of the road. Um, this is the decrease in uh, total lesion glycolysis, so how much inflammation was present, and this is the decrease in the total amount of uh, lesion-associated mass. And again, these bulk level statistics don't really give you a good handle for what the drug is really doing. So I think, again, you have to push the analysis, and we're pushing the analysis towards a more complicated uh, way of looking at these. And I don't want to get lost in the details, uh, and I definitely don't want to get trapped, um, particularly with mathematicians in the room, um, <laughs> trying to describe the analysis that we've been trying to do with these. But I do want to give you a flavor of this, that when we take these uh, scans apart, computationally, we can do, um, uh, describe any number of points. We typically describe 10,000 different cubes from a patient and what happens to them over the, the course of, the, of time. And those cubes you can divide up into different regions that we might think would relate to the pathology that we're looking at, the lesion. So big cavities or big areas of consolidation we think should have these characteristics. And so these are the, the kinds of characteristics we'll put together. And that's one approach that certainly um, useful, um, but we're trying to get more refined about that. And I'll show you a little bit later um, a little bit more about how we're trying to get better uh, refined in that kind of analysis. And then just to whet your appetite, um, this is uh, studies that are ongoing, um, and I'm not, I, I actually can't tell you what, um, what, this what this particular patient on, but I just want to emphasize we're now doing two drug combinations. And I know we're recruiting, uh, whoops, I know we're recruiting three different arms, but I'm completely blind to which patient is on which because I'm doing the analysis. And so I don't know what this patient is on, but I look at this scan and I go, holy cow, in two weeks, 
really? We've taken that and reduced it to that. It's amazing. I don't know which combination it is. I don't want to know um, yet till we finish the analysis. But we're seeing effects that are much greater than the four drug combination we use in standard of care therapy right now with a true drug combination in these advanced combination studies. And I should say, because I wasn't planning on talking about this until David was, was a no-show, that um, these, a lot of these studies were funded by the EDCTP and are part of a collaborative program that um, Andreas and, uh, and David and, and myself are part of as, uh, as uh, that grant. Okay, um, so my second uh, little story here and revolves around the question of do we really need to achieve sterile cure? Um, and uh, I think uh, not to minimize the importance of immunology and macrophages and all due respect to people who believe in the immune system. Um, I, I <laughs> I actually went into this study thinking, yes, I mean, absolutely. We want to turn, we want to pour bleach in, into the patients. We want everything dead in there to, to start it out. And so this is a study that we did um, called the Catalysis Study with uh, Gerhard Walzel and Fanny Malabra and others uh, here at, uh, at Stellenbosch, where we recruited a bunch of uh, TB patients and gave them PET CT scans uh, at baseline after a month of treatment and then at the end of treatment at six months and then we watched and saw what happened and looked for development of relapse uh, disease in those. And it's published so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time um, doing it but the really remarkable uh, thing was that what I thought, which is we should push everybody at the end of treatment, these are drug susceptible patients, what we should push everybody into this category, that only happened 14 times. <laughs> People improved but always there was residual pathology. And most of the time it was a sort of a mixed response. You know, they, most of the lesions they had at baseline were gone, but they had new lesions that appeared somewhere else in the lung. And so that really got us thinking about whether we ever actually achieved durable cure, a sterilizing cure in patients, or whether we always just force the system back into some sort of equilibrium where your immune system is controlling it with the help of an initial bolus of, of chemotherapy, which we now believe is much closer to the truth with what we do with chemotherapy than that we ever actually eradicate the bacteria. It's incredibly difficult to eradicate the bacteria. And to sort of prove that, um, Gerhardt, um, in collaboration with Gary Skulnick uh, at Stanford, uh, went in and bronked a bunch of these patients and showed that he could detect messenger RNA from the bug still in those patients. So there's no question it wasn't just residual inflammation. There were live bacteria that were still transcribing messages and still making proteins and still doing their thing in patients at the end of treatment who were perfectly healthy, who never got symptomatic again in the next year. So there's, uh, again, I think we, we fool ourselves when we talk about getting sterile cure. I think what we need to do is reestablish equilibrium in patients and keep them under control within their own system. Okay, so the, um, the third topic I wanted to address briefly was what lesion types determine that duration of treatment that's required to avoid relapse. We heard quite a bit um, today about bacterial um, determinants, but I'm talking now about what patient uh, determinants actually contribute to that. And of course the two things are linked, so um, I, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get back to that towards the end. And what I want to describe to you is a large uh, study we've recently finished um, again, mostly in the Western Cape, uh, called PREDICT-TB, where we took a cohort of patients and we, we said, okay, we're really smart. We know um, patients who have disease that's really severe and we're, we're not gonna randomize these patients, but we're gonna take patients who have modest amounts of TB disease and we're gonna stop them after four months of chemotherapy randomly. We'll take half the patients and we'll say, okay, you've met this set of criteria, you've had this much change in your lung disease volume, and we're going to stop half of you, and the other half we're going to give the full six months of treatment, and then we're going to look and see what happens uh, in the relapse uh, patients who inevitably develop relapse. Fully expecting that we knew enough to be able to say what um, complex or extensive TB disease is, which came up during the, the symposium when I, and I asked about that because I'm, I, we thought we knew what complex disease was, uh, and we were completely wrong. <laughs> Um, PREDICT was uh, the largest, most complicated study I've ever been part of and that I ever want to be part of. Um, it recruited patients across 10 clinical sites, five in central China and five here in the Western Cape. Um, that was at the insistence of one of our funders who wanted to see how the disease, uh, globally how the disease um, was manifested. 
Um, I have to say, I'm glad we did it in, in two very different contexts, but it was incredibly difficult. And uh, I made million mile uh, clubs uh, by the, by I think three different million mile uh, clubs uh, flying around as a result of trying to get this study actually um, done, which is not something I'm particularly happy about. <clears throat> um, it, almost perfectly overlapped uh, with COVID, the end of the, the trial almost perfectly overlapped with COVID. So we were pretty much through um, recruitment when uh, COVID hit. And you can see when COVID hit because our enrollment dropped to zero um, almost overnight. Um, after we took a look at um, patients uh, at that point and we evaluated how we could follow people up and how we were doing things in the clinic, it became clear that we just needed to stop enrollment until COVID had run its course and we could, um, we could do it. But we were pretty close to full enrollment. And so at that point, we decided to cut the study, cut our losses because our TB clinics in China were shut down. In South Africa, we're full of COVID patients and people were distracted and it was very hard to get anything done. And so uh, the study was slightly prematurely um, terminated to where we had uh, 135 that were uh, randomized to arm B uh, and 141 randomized to arm uh, C. And we had uh, aimed to have 300 total, 150 and 150. So we were close, um, but we didn't quite get there. But we did actually get there in terms of the endpoints. And so a couple of quick observations from that. One is uh, Chinese TB patients are completely different from South African TB patients. And that's quantitatively uh, borne out by these statistics. You can see both cavity size, the amount of disease they have, the total, glee, uh, uh, total amount of inflammation they have in their lungs is quantitatively completely statistically significant different between them. Chinese uh, patients have much less severe disease. I'm not going to say I know why. I don't know why. It's just the observation when you actually look at it. That, that uh, this four-month treatment algorithm works perfectly fine in the Chinese um, um, population. Um, the other thing we noticed, which was a, a follow-on from the catalysis study, was that these new lesions that we're seeing in patients were alarmingly common. In fact, we saw new lesions as the rule rather than the exception. And when we finally realized what was going on after staring at these for a long period of time, and I just want to illustrate this because uh, we could see these new lesions appearing, and they were always accompanied by an inflamed bronchus. And so the disease was actually dripping out of an active cavity into another part of the lung and igniting a new site of disease. And we could tell you who slept on their left side and who slept on their right side, because you could see what direction the drips were running from the cavity down into to form these new lesions, which was pretty remarkable and I think really let us um, understand a lot better what we were looking at when we were seeing this amount of disease. And the problem is these, these sort of newly formed, uh, strictly within the airway lesions actually heal very quickly. So they respond to drugs really quickly. So if you only look at the total amount of disease, you're fooled because you're looking at all these new lesions that are really easy to cure and you're not looking at the really chronic lesions like the cavities that are very difficult to cure. So yeah, and again, we, we sort of mapped that quantitatively so we could actually um, see all these cases where we saw bron uh, bronchial spread of disease across the, uh, both within a single lung and then across the lung into the, into the opposite um, side as well, ipsilateral uh, spread and contralateral spread of, of disease. Um, and so how did we do? Well, I told you when we went into this, I expected uh, that the vast majority of the relapses would be in RMA. Wrong. Um, we expected that the moderate disease wouldn't have a significant, we would have equivalence between these two in terms of outcomes. Wrong again. Um, we had 17 relapses in the, the shortened arm. So clearly there was something we weren't considering when we thought we knew what severe disease was and we thought we knew what adequate treatment was um, in these patients. And then in retrospect, not surprising, but, um, but gratifying, I guess, in a sense, was the one clear answer uh, from, the, from the study that was really crystal clear was that um, every time we had a relapse, because now we had patients who we followed for a very long time, so this is four months um, after treatment is initiated, this is after one month, after four months, and this is when the patient relapses. And it was quite clear that in every single case where the patient relapsed, it was a pre-existing cavity at the time they were diagnosed with disease. So cavities are clearly responsible for relapse disease, which had been hinted at from the epidemiologic studies, but you never were sure it was the same cavity and you, know, you just knew what the baseline characteristics were. Now we're sure it's the same cavity. And it wasn't just cavities. 
was actually cavities that had particularly thick walls that seemed to be uh, inclined to do this. And so we developed this model where we, we think of things as being pre-cavitary and then opening into the airways, and then they sort of start to empty out. And this is when you see new lesions emerging as the cavity casium empties out into the sputum, and then you see a clean cavity. And these are the cavities that appear most likely um, to, to be responsible for relapse in those patients. And I don't need to go into the details for this, but I, I, it, does, it makes sense and it's a relatively transient moment in time. And the problem is when you see a patient at diagnosis and their sputum smear positive, you don't know anything about what their cavity looks like. And this is a moment in time for the patient. So if you catch them at the wrong moment and they have a really dirty cavity presence, they may be fated to fail treatment regardless of how good the treatment is because the cavity, because this is such a privileged environment and the drugs can't actually get into that dirty cavity. But at least we know where to focus our efforts preclinically in trying to identify things that could genuinely shorten disease uh, for patients. Um, the other thing uh, for Sarah, um, uh, relapse, uh, relapse is very much associated with the strain clade uh, of these. And so in this particular um, uh, example, I'm just showing you, uh, and again, the clade doesn't, for those of you who aren't sort of TB aficionados, it doesn't, doesn't matter so much. But in this case, this is the sort of presentation at uh, all the samples within uh, uh, RMC, and this is the relapse samples. And you can see that this particular lineage of TB is vastly overrepresented in the relapse cases. But it's all tied together because that particular lineage of TB probably also has more of a proclivity to form cavities and the, all of this and perhaps is more drug resilient and other things we've talked about. So it's not separate, um, but we're not ignoring the bacterial uh, factors either. And finally, um, what I wanted to address was how do we really assess the variability in individual um, disease presentation? Because this is one of the big difficulties in TB patients. It's this huge spectrum of disease. Some patients have a very tiny cavity or a very tiny lesion in one lobe. Other patients have completely destroyed lungs. I mean, that did where it's really just travi travesty. And there's probably nothing that can be done to save patients at some stage of that. And our answer to that has been to try to get to um, a more sophisticated way of doing the analysis of the radiology data. And I've introduced you to this concept already of this sort of bulk analysis versus this sort of second uh, level analysis. But I want to take that a little bit further now and show you we can divide that data into many different ways. And so this is just one single patient. And this is uh, just one set of metrics that divide it into about 5,500 cubes. But we can just decrease that to as few as a single voxel, a single voxel from the PET uh, image on one side. And we end up with about 70,000 different measurements from one single patient. And so now we can start to ask questions about what those voxels actually look like. And, um, Again, borrowing heavily from the cancer field, what we've done is turn not just uh, to the sort of bulk level analysis of how much dense material or how much hot material is present, but what do they look like? What's the shape? What's the texture of those? And using these sort of radiomic um, techniques that have been developed in cancer uh, diagnosis and treatment, we can then develop uh, sets of textural features and radiomic uh, features and combine those with clinical variables and then start to ask questions about what are the details about what kinds of lesions respond to these drugs and then how do we put them together in ways that actually make sure all the different lesion types um, respond to all the different drugs. Okay, again, um, I will quickly get in trouble if I try to explain this in, in too much detail because I'm neither a mathematician nor particularly gifted in, in uh, imaging uh, science. But what they can do then is create clusters of these features and then map them onto all these different uh, feature maps and ask for what are the unique features, clusters of types of lesions or types of cubes that we're actually seeing within those patients. And using those, um, they can then create models for predicting uh, whether those lesion types are relatively likely to respond to drug X or drug Y or drug Z or the combinations of X and Y and X and Z. And then what does a cure actually look like? And when these features are applied um, to things like the predict data set, and I'm, I neither understand nor completely believe this data yet, but they can completely predict based on the baseline characteristics which patients will uh, relapse with disease uh, based on the arm they were assigned in the, in the PREDICT study um, at, in the beginning. And I say I don't believe it because mostly because I don't understand the, the level of the analysis, but I have some very smart mathematicians and some very smart stats people who are working on this, and I hope they'll convince me and explain it to me well enough that I could explain it to you one day, which um, I look forward to. 
again, these, to my level of, of understanding, I try to put these clusters that they derive computationally into groups, and then I go back and look at the patients and say, okay, yes, I can see why this is grouped, why these lesions are, types are grouped together, because these are cavities without obvious consolidations, whereas this involves cavity, air, but within an area of large consolidation in the lungs. And so at that level of reasoning, I can start to put things together into groups that make sense to me, but I'm not quite uh, confident that I'm ever going to be able to do, to do the kind of machine, understand the kind of machine learning algorithms that are being applied to the data to tease this apart into ways of rationally doing the combinations. Okay, um, so the main take home messages I want to leave you with. Uh, Cavities, uh, particularly thick-walled uh, cavities and what we're calling dirty cavities, are the primary cause of relapse after four months of treatment. Uh, it's my uh, firm belief that patients, that there's not a one-size-fits-all, and this is, I should say, this is strictly um, contrary to everything that many people are saying in public um, about TB treatment, that I don't think we can think about patients as one-size-fits-all or one duration of treatment fits, fits all, but I think we need to be cleverer about the way we stratify patients so that we recognize when a patient needs more extensive treatment and less extensive treatment. Um, Again, we rarely see complete resolution of disease, and I'm not sure we ever will. Um, so we really need to rethink what our goal is in terms of treatment, whether we need to sterilize patients or whether we start to understand what that immune balance looks like that we're resetting. Um, I do believe new tools like PET-CT um, can improve our ability to select optimal regimens uh, in small numbers of patients prior to committing to very large uh, phase three studies, which I think we have to do, we have to be cleverer than that or we're gonna end up with a less than ideal um, situation from all the potentially new drugs we have. And I do think this new field of radiomics can really facilitate the analysis of drug-specific interactions in patients in a way that lets us get from the in vitro understanding of what the drug is doing to what it's actually happening within the patients. There are an awful lot of people um, to acknowledge, I, but I particularly want to pick out my South African uh, colleagues who I've mentioned before um, who were involved in that, and at UCT, Rob um, Wilkinson, and then um, a whole team of programming people who um, have generously dedicated their time uh, from NIH who are you know, more lucratively involved in cancer um, uh, imaging analysis, but uh, agree to sort of slum it with us in TB. Um, and try to um, make some of that, make some progress in understanding what these very complex analyses are telling us. And finally, um, a study particularly like PREDICT wouldn't happen without a, a, an amazing constellation of funders who are willing to believe in us, including both my ex-boss, uh, Tony Fauci, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, and EDCTP, and the Grand Challengers China, and National Science Foundation of China, so you get the idea. I mean, this was a huge effort and, um, and something I'm very proud that we accomplished, but something that um, I don't ever want to do again. <laughs> so thank you very much. Do we have questions or this is a not a question place? <laughs> Okay, so, so thank you so much for the talk. Um, so uh, do, uh, why don't we clap again? I think that was an excellent talk. <laughs> With a number of takeaways. So we have a few minutes for questions. Are there any questions from the floor? Any questions? Yes, so can we have the mic? So there's one hand. Is there any other hand? I only see, okay, one, two, three on this side. And then on the right, were you in the room? <laughs> okay, good. I've got one here as well. So we'll go one, two, three, and then four on the right. So obviously it's, it's wonderful to see the, the new drugs coming through in TV research. And I guess those are initiated by drug, um, drug um, resilience or um, resistance in the community. Your sort of approach that you're looking at seems to be appearing as a paranostic kind of approach where you do you think that will help us resist resistance in the future of these new drug types? Ooh. You know, resistance is kind of inevitable, right? I mean, I, we, ha we did have a very good evolutionary biology talk today about how to avoid um, 
the development of resistance, and I'm still kind of mulling over how we apply that in, in, pr in practice to, to when we're developing new regimens of drugs. Um, I, I don't, you know, at, at this point in time, my sort of gut level reaction is resistance is in in inevitable to the new drugs as well as the old drugs, and we have to keep this up until we get to a point where we either have a vaccine or we have some other intervention that we can uh, avoid using drugs completely. But I don't see that happening in my lifetime. Well, the way I've come to a lot of things in my clinical um, career, which is we, we've stole it from cancer. <laughs> I mean, we literally thought, I mean, because it's, it actually was, so the cancer people thought this was a big problem because it was hard to distinguish tuberculomas from, uh, from malignancies. And so it was already known in the literature that cancer, that TB could be a complication of it. And I thought, well, that's not a complication, and you know, that's not a glitch, that's a feature for me, so, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, that's just amazing. Um, I was really interested to see the new drug, drug combinations, which are absolutely phenomenal. I was wondering what the price points on those look like, and if they'll be accessible, and if that's something that's considered when putting these um, combination therapies together. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. I think people are very sensitized to it because of the Janssen experience and the, the pricing of bedaquiline. Um, what I can tell you is a lot of these drugs were developed through the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and through NIH um, resources. And a lot of the companies that are involved, like we worked very closely with Merck uh, for developing a non-toxic oxazolidinone. Um, and they all, all agreed to global access um, before they receive any public funding for this. So these will be priced at cost and, just, and with, with IP protections guaranteed in the developing world. And that's all upfront when you're taking money from the foundation especially. Yeah, I think it's a combination of both. I mean, I think you know, the, when the when the bacteria actually finally do erode their way into the into the airways, I think there's a process of reaeration where they're reorienting metabolism to be actively growing again. Uh, but they're coming out of casium and through a very dormant phase, and so I think it's it, both things are happening. But I also. Hello. There we go. But I, but I think there's also a question of access. You know, a cavity, so when the cavity opens into the airways, that's the moment that the bacteria goes from inside your body to outside your body, right? So it's no longer connected to the bloodstream. The thick fibrotic capsule is preventing blood. So the only way the drug gets in is if it's carried in by neutrophils or macrophages or some other inflammatory cell that's actually getting it. So it's not no longer in contact with the circulatory system. So I think that's an important message. It is excess of the drugs, but it's also the metabolism of the bugs that's rapidly changing at that point. And I think we really need to focus on that and understand what's happening in those bugs to attack it better. Thanks, Dee. Thank you very much. A lovely talk. I'm not going to ask anything about macrophages. <laughs> But I am going to ask a bit of a philosophical question. So I've just recently come back from a Times Higher Education meeting in Sydney on the World Academic Summit, which is a collection of all the world higher education leaders, etc. Mm -hmm. And the theme of the, of the conference was um, multidisciplinarity. Um, and the sub-theme is internationalization. And a great worry was expressed about 
the backlash and challenge to internationalization recently because of growing nationalism and populism. Mm. So we just saw the wonderful examples of collaboration here in South Africa and China, and where, um, and, and that's how we advance science. Mm. Do you, what are your thoughts on, you already said this is such a difficult study to do, on how one can generalize findings if we, if we, if we don't, if we don't, if we can't globalize? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we have to globalize people, right? I, and one thing that I really liked about the PREDICT um, study was we would have invest, investigator meetings where the Chinese would come to South Africa and the South Africans would go to China and we would all get together and it was clear we were all TB scientists. We were all in the same field and we were all in the same boat together. And I think that sense of shared uh, mission uh, built a very strong team out of that. And I, uh, I think, there are obvious barriers. You know, I don't know if we could do that today in China because China has changed so much in the last five years. Um, but it was a beautiful thing while it lasted and I think we have to rise above the nationalism, recognize we're all scientists, recognize we're all trying to accomplish something important and move that forward. It's, it's critical. Yeah. So, I have a question. Um, you know, you know, why, why is it the thick wolf candy? Because there's two things that I can think of. One is vascularization and then age of the lesion. The assumption would be it would be older. Right? But what, what can you can speculate on that? So I think cavities don't stay thick-walled for very long. I mean, I think that casium, so we see it in uh, Joanne Flynn's non-human primates, for instance. I mean, these, these cavities, when they start to penetrate into the airway, they liquefy quite fast. And so it's only present for maybe a month in a patient. So if you happen to be diagnosed and started on treatment during that month, that's, that's bad. But if your cavity has time to, to shed all the bacteria from inside it, you cough them all up in your sputum, then you're probably going to do okay. So I think it's kind of a stochastic thing where the cavity, uh, that period of thick walledness or dirtiness uh, only lasts uh, for a short period of time. And that can of course reseed the lung as well. Yep. I would speculate, because we only have you know, partial data to support it, that the dirty cavity, which has a necrotic center, which is dead, dead cells, is not only separated from the blood circulation, which is the way the antibiotics would penetrate, but actually there are no cells, immune cells, coming into the necrotic site. It's <laughs> solid. It hasn't liquefied yet and isn't the cavity yet. So during that short period that you have a so-called dirty lesion, you don't have a vascular jet for antibiotics to get in, and the organisms are not reviable cells, so they're not replicated. They're sitting in the casein, viable but non replicating So even if antibiotics do get in, they won't get in. But once they start liquefying and they start spreading, and cells can get to the surface of the cavity, macrophages, polys, they start replicating again, they're viable, and those are the ones that disseminate and spread. Because they're leaving a liquefied cavity and being spread through the animals. Which goes back almost 25 years ago to Gilla and I. Gilla and my first co-publication, which des described the microenvironment of the, <laughs> of the cavity. <laughs> So, any more questions? No? Okay, thank you very much. And thanks so much for challenging us. I guess uh, radiomics is a new field, you say. So, can you break it down for your mathematician and my ma mathematician friends? I know that the data, so obviously we have a school for data science and computational thinking, and I guess, uh, you know, people are in other fields, so, um, you know, I, I think I like the fact that you have some data that people can work with in terms of um, machine learning and some of the analytics that could come from there. But how do you break down radi radiomics for mathematicians? 
<laughs> in a simple language, layman's language. I mean, I, I'm sure they could describe it better than I could. I mean, it's the relationship of the different um, intensities to it. So it's, I think the simple way I think about it is it's textures, right? It's how, what the texture looks like. And when you look across a lesion, how big is the size and what's the texture and how do you describe that? But there's lots of different, like really fancy, like if you looked at the slide at all, there's mm -hmm. entropy and uh, all kinds of crazy descriptions of what that looks like. <laughs> cool. Thank you very much. Okay, let's give him a hand. Uh, you uh, don't go away yet. So just to say thank you so much. Can I ask um, uh, the, the, the rector and also the chancellor to come forward? We have a gift exchange and a photo moment, and then our, uh, I didn't acknowledge our most important person in the room who's made this possible as well, our director of STEERS as well. So can we just thank uh, uh, Professor Chirumir as well, if you can join us in front. Um, and if I can be guided by our public relations, where do you want the positioning of the gift? Can you advise where the picture should be, please? Okay. Uh, can you keep this? What is it? Um, sorry, can I just ask to break the agenda for the Wallenberg Foundation? Where's Ingrid? Is Ingrid with us? Yes, please. Can you run and join? Thank you. Okay, so, so we've come to the end of the session, but for, from my side, just to say thank you very much again for attending, and also we should just remember that for an occasion like this, uh, it does take a team to put things together, so I just want to thank our corporate team, uh, marketing team, and of course the STS team uh, that has been behind the scenes as well as the audiovisual. Um, our Chancellor, of course, for hosting this series, and we look forward to the next one just as much. And I think the one thing that you heard also from the Chancellor is still continues to advocate, of course, for the recognition of every person's dignity, freedom, and equality, and um, just the way you share and how you know, we, we relate to um, you know, what you portray and what you do for our country. And the challenges we go through, we believe that will be better one day. Things will get better one day. On Friday, we all dress up in green, right? <laughs> to support our team. And I think that's something we should look forward to. So yeah, so we should win that much. Huh? So I'm sorry for the people that we beat, if there are any people in the room. Um, so I apologize that we won. But anyway, so again, please enjoy. There's a reception going on right now. So please enjoy the reception. And we thank our speaker once again and all of you. Um, there is wine, drink, you can drink, but tomorrow we start again, especially for the mathematics people. Yeah, enjoy the evening. Thank you.